You are listening to the IoT for All Media Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the IoT for All podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Chacon. And on today's episode, we have Matt Hatton, one of the founding partners of Transform Insights. Matt has actually been a guest before. Um, and he comes on to talk a lot about very high level predictions, trends, market kind of insights that he's seeing. Uh, Transform Insights, for those of you who may be unfamiliar, is a firm focused on helping advise companies on IoT, AI, digital transformation, and the like. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about the current state of the IoT market, digital transformation market, where we kind of see it going, biggest contributors to the success of, of the industry. We talk about the connectivity landscape a good bit, how that's playing a role. We're also talking about how people are making buying decisions. They're kind of leaning more towards going towards platform companies now, um, which is interesting to talk about. And at the same time, we're going to, we're going to discuss off-shelf solutions, kind of the benefits there, as well as how that compares to other types of, of buying offerings, you know, getting into the customization side of things and so forth. And then we wrap up by talking high level about some adoption best practices. So the insights and trends um, and knowledge that, that Matt comes on here to share is, is fantastic. And I promise you won't want to miss this one. But before we get into this episode, if any of you out there are looking to enter the fast growing and profitable IoT market, but don't know where to start, check out our sponsor Leverage. Leverage's IoT solutions development platform provides everything you need to create turnkey IoT products that you can white label and resell under your own brand. To learn more, go to iotchangeseverything.com. That's iotchangeseverything.com. And without further ado, please enjoy this episode of the IoT for All podcast. Welcome, Matt, back to the IoT for All show. Thanks for being here again. Thanks, Ryan. My pleasure. Yeah, it's fantastic to have you. There's a lot of interesting things going on uh, over at Transforma that I wanted to dive into and um, you've been putting out some great content that I thought would make a fantastic podcast for our audience. And I'm sure there's some of our audience out there who may be uh, a little unfamiliar and I'd love it if you could start off by just giving a quick intro and some background on yourself as well as the company. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, anyone who's not familiar with us, they will be forgiven. We're only about <laughs> two, and a, two and a little bit years old. Uh, so we're something of a child of uh, the the lockdown uh, we kicked off things in in November 2019 uh, so we only had about what three or four months before the whole world shut down and uh, sure. nobody was able to go anywhere uh, so we, we found it a little bit a little bit tricky getting getting the message out in a face to face kind of a way so we've sure. we've done sure. what we can to, to to get it out there in a in a virtual way with some of the some of the work that we do uh, yeah transforming insights we're uh, industry analyst firm focused on what we term digital transformation. It's a bit of a catch-all term now, a bit of an umbrella mm -hmm. for a whole bunch of disruptive technologies, uh, first and foremost of which is Internet of Things, but we also cover things like AI, robotic process automation, blockchain, a bunch of other things that enterprises might be considering using to change the way that they do business. So we work with companies that adopt new technologies and also companies that sell new technologies, but right on that edge of that disruptive uh, space, really, that's, right. that's really where the focus is. And and would you mind sharing a little bit about your background experience, kind of how you got there? Yeah, absolutely. We um, founded, myself and Jim Morris, who were the, the, who were the founders of Transformer Insights, we actually founded a, another analyst firm uh, previously, so back in 2011, mm -hmm. uh, he and I founded Makina Research, which was an IoT focus specifically. Uh, just IoT focused analyst firm, uh, which we sold to Gartner in 2016. We did a little bit of uh, time working for Gartner, a few other things sure. in, in between, and then came back with with Transformer Insights. Uh, prior to that, I'd been an analyst for uh, about 25, well, altogether about 25 years uh, experience. Okay. And this little bit of time working for mobile operators, but mostly as, a, as an industry analyst. Fantastic. So I guess a good question to kind of start this out is just from a high level perspective, how are you viewing the IoT market? Like what's the current market look like right now in your all's eyes? You know, what are you most interested in? Where are the big trends? You know, what are you optimistic about? Maybe what's what concerns do you have? Just kind of what are you seeing at a high level of the market in general? I, I think it's uh it's a market that's somewhat dominated by the lockdown. To, okay. to an extent, it's it certainly had an impact on on a lot of a lot of areas in terms of the the, the verticals that are uh, adopting. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of movement in uh, smart buildings, for instance. Okay, you've got to cope, cope with lockdown, so the smart buildings start, okay. start looking very interesting. Uh, healthcare related uh, things, uh, industrial. So there's a lot of moves towards onshoring, 
Uh, so that's that's um, onshoring of production. I I, I mean, um, and as a result, uh, it's driving um, some growth, quite significant growth in in a lot of those areas. But I, I think we'd say uh, it was pretty pretty robust. Twenty twenty was a bit of a challenging year. Sure. Um, you had challenges with it was more a supply issue rather than demand issue though though, though actually mm. um, but as we got through 2021 a lot of those got got resolved and and things um, started to look look a little bit more more positive thinking at a more macro level um I'd say it's in in a pretty healthy state at the at the moment we've had a lot of a lot of changing dynamics going on in the in the market. We'll talk about those a little bit. I think a lot of that comes out sure. from the um, from the survey work that we we did recently. We can okay. come on to that in a in a little bit. Uh, but we've got some some in interesting changing dynamics in, in terms of things like um, uh, growth of edge computing. Where are you going to put the processing? Where does that where does that reside? Where's the where's the intelligence of the of the IoT device? And that kind of um, overlapping between IoT and AI, you know, IoT moves into right. automation, and automation moves into mm -hmm. uh, something that requires a little bit more more intelligence. So there's there's you know quite a lot of sophistication happening in in there. You, mm -hmm. You've got increasing interest uh, from the hyperscalers. So I see AWS and Microsoft looming large over this space. That's uh, it's a very interesting uh, trend in the in the space, and certainly one that we'd we'd expect to to carry on into the next next few years. And you know those those two particularly less so Google, but certainly right. AWS and Microsoft looking like they they're, they're going to be um, tearing up some some trees. A, a lot of a lot more productization. We'll talk about this in, in in a bit as well. So and platformization. So so these these sets of tools that have become uh, available over about the last decade starting to really uh, make some some sense and, and drive out a lot of the complexity in in deploying IoT for pretty much every enterprise. I, I talk about it in the context of I talk about it as uh, something called thin IoT is how how I describe it. You've got these you've got these layers. You've got hardware layer and you've got software and you've got middleware on the device and you've got all these various different layers. And, and gradually over the last decade or so, uh, we've seen a, um, a simplification uh, of, of each of those layers, a, either driving out of complexity or the introduction of some new technology which is more appropriate for deploying IoT and, and helping with it operate in constrained environments. So that might be a, a device OS that's got a really small footprint, or it might be things like eSIM for um, for embedding the, the the SIM or actually specifically iSIM putting the the SIM right. uh, as a as a component on the on the device or it might be networks it might be a variety of mesh networks or, or, or whatever but across the board across that stack that that thin IoT stack we're seeing seeing the simplification really really um, pretty much permeating through the through the whole of it. So I think we're in a we're in pretty healthy shape. If the, um, if the lockdown hadn't hadn't turned up, then maybe we'd be in even healthier shape. Yeah, I've we've seen similar things where a lot of the use case demand has definitely shifted due to COVID. Um, 2020 was interesting because I felt like there was a lot of uncertainty in a lot of companies' minds. So projects were being mm. slowed down or halted or kind of pushed off. But as people start to understand the pandemic and what was going to happen and, and kind of the future outlook was like, they seem to get back into the groove of, of those IoT projects because, I mean, that the premise of what these projects are trying to do would help them be more efficient in case, you know, they had labor shortages or they had to change their resource allocation or something along those lines. They, mm -hmm. These were important. These were kind of top of mind things for these companies. But until they understood what was happening with their finances, it was something they wanted to kind of just, just put on hold. But it was yeah. good to see that that kind of came back in 2021. And I think that's really going to project us forward in 2022 in a very positive direction mm -hmm. with a lot of new industries being involved and really considering IoT than maybe were before. Yeah, it, it's certainly something that we've seen. One of the things that we do is uh, ultra granular IoT market forecasts. And so we dig into all of the various different use cases in, in IoT. Mm -hmm. and, and you take something like smart metering. Well, 2020, those countries where there was a, uh, an ongoing smart metering deployment, well, 2020 was a, a year when that more or less 
slowed down, stopped. Not, not. I think probably because of what what you're talking about. The which is a- absolutely right, where um, there was some uncertainty, but just getting the right people in the right place and the supply chain related issues with getting your your hardware into place, having the the, the teams available to go and do the the work. So that was. That was obviously uh, obviously challenging, but but you're right about people just sort of took a break, took a, a breath, and said, "Hey, w- w- this is probably the first time that most of us have experienced anything uh, approaching this sort of level of a pandemic. We don't know what's going to happen. Um, let's let, let's let's sit tight." And then the realization was, "Hang on a minute." Uh, for many people, th- this could be pretty good for business. In, in, in mm-hmm. you know, not not wanting to be too mercenary about it, but you know, it's it's, it's been it's been pretty good for for business in in some cases. Anybody serving the the, the automotive industry, not so much because that's that's has it had its struggles. People weren't buying new cars and uh, and mm-hmm. so on. But anybody addressing things like healthcare or, or or smart building, some of those other sectors that I I mentioned earlier, very. Um, uh, very positive kind of a kind of a, a spike on on what they were doing. The, the tech t- tech sector, I, I'm I'm happy I work in the tech sector, right? It's, it, <laughs> it, it, there's there's a lot worse sectors to uh, have had to um to, to sit yeah. out the um the the lockdown uh, as part of uh, hospitality and uh, and so on. Pretty challenging. Yeah, I mean, and the hope is that the technology industry kind of helps propel mm-hmm. us forward out of this as well as mm-hmm. sets us up to handle this better if this happens again. And mm. I think that's where a lot of these IoT use cases with contact tracing and the smart, you know, um, implementing new solutions within buildings and workplaces um, is something that we weren't really thinking about as a priority two years ago, right? So mm. it definitely shifted the conversation around what use cases are important and also what use cases are even possible um, because this, again, this wasn't something that we've really had to deal with um, as a society while these technologies have been around so and and another one to throw in that um it there's a possibility it's been relatively short term you know a couple of years in the in the grand scheme of history but might it have changed some human behavior well there's certainly been a uh an urban to rural migration Mm -hmm. that that you know that seems to be the um, seems to be the case. There's been a, a a flight out of the cities and towards the the suburbs, or even even towards rural areas. And so, for for cities, cities need to look at how do we make life in the city better. How can we use right. technology to improve, improve the experience of of living in a city to to either stem that or or maybe reverse the trend. And the same thing's also true in in buildings. Okay. Uh, almost everybody has gone to some extent to working from home. Now, I, I've been working from home for more or less the last 10 years, so it's made pretty much no no difference to me whatsoever. But for a lot of people, it's it's been quite a quite a fundamental change. And and, and building owners, maybe they've got a got a communications or a or a, a PR job to do to to get people to go back into the office, to want to go back into into the office and so mm-hmm. it's, it's incumbent on them on facilities managers or or commercial building owners to make this environment so nice that you wouldn't want to work from home you want to you want to go work in the uh, in the office and a lot of that's going to be about using technology so you know there's some there's some uh, some potential high points coming up as well i'd say with with those kinds of kinds of requirements absolutely those are all fantastic points um i wanted to kind of shift a little bit away from kind of the high level just market discussion real quick and talk a little bit about um, the connectivity landscape mm-hmm. a bit. I've been having a lot of conversations through other podcast episodes about the connectivity landscape and kind of what's happening in that space. From your perspective, what are you seeing there? Like what, what are, are there any kind of key trends on the connectivity side of things? You know, where do you see the opportunity? What does the kind of future look like? Um, and, and just generally just get start there around connectivity. Yeah, there's there's a lot of really interesting stuff happening at the at the moment. Actually, um, we've got the likes of well, to to start furthest out and then work in sure. Leo satellites. Mm-hmm. There's um, there's there's always been some use of of satellite for for IoT, but really it's been uh, about high value items in really remote uh, places, and and it didn't really. Um, trouble the market too much there were a couple of specialist players but um but it uh, hasn't been a a huge bit of the market but then you've got 
Now, dozens of companies uh, who have launched or in the process of launching these um, networks of, of satellites with the hope that they'll be able to use uh, those for for connecting IoT devices. I'm I'm still I'm going to reserve judgment on on those and say uh, it's always going to be cheaper to connect things using a terrestrial network and and therefore mm. there's still always going to be fighting out for the for the um, uh, for those market segments which are that bit more remote. I mean there might be some opportunities to see with agriculture and mining and and transportation and 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 so on, but um, it's it's a bit a bit challenging that that space. Moving a little closer to, to home, uh, the interesting dynamics are around uh, some technologies which have been available for a little while, uh, but are really starting to um, have an impact or starting to be be, be un understood for for what they are. And that's firstly five G. Mm -hmm. um, so bit. Bit of a of an in, interesting one, five G. I mean, obviously, long term, the direction of, of travel is towards okay. Well, everything will be be five G uh, networks. Um, but for for IoT, the the big capabilities around uh, ultra low latency and and high bandwidth, um, useful for a few use cases. But but really, it's the it's the uh, being able to support um, millions of devices. It's that massive machine type communication uh, capability that's the interesting right. one. And you've got the MBIoT and LTEM technologies that are starting to actually become somewhat mature. We're still kind of on the cusp of the seeing really significant mass market adoption and understanding how how that works. Um, ditto with the with the competitor, which is which is LoRa, um, which historically was deployed as private networks, but is increasingly being deployed as as um, as public networks, national public networks. So there's some really interesting tools becoming uh, made available for, for for anybody who's thinking about okay, well, which which access technology do should should I be using? What's um, what's what's the most appropriate for me? In fact, I, I mentioned about this thin IoT uh, stack. The connectivity piece is absolutely one of those, and we include in that things like those low power wide area technologies I was talking about, the MBIoT and LTEM, which sit under the five G umbrella, and thinking about LoRa, um, but particularly those those three, I I, I think, um, and we're we're starting to see some of that uh, really come come through. Um, other other things to watch. Uh, eSIM starting to to get some um, get some traction now, but mostly from the virtual network operators. They seem to be the ones who are really able to embrace it because yeah. I think there's a mentality issue. They're very used to this idea of having commercial relationships with multiple operators and switching a connection between them and 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 turning a, a connection that's uh, on one network to a connection that's on a ne another network. Right. That's that's you know that's, that's bread and butter for them. Sure. Um, for the mobile network operators, less so, and it's taken them a little bit longer to to adapt and kind of understand what this this opportunity that might be presented by by eSIM. Uh, so, I mean, that's that's just a few things I could I could ramble on for, sure. for hours about this stuff, Ryan. The, the connectivity space is um, is is a big one for us and one that we um, we, we focus a lot of our attention. on. So, so let me also ask you this because um, this kind of connects to um, I think a recent article you you put out. I don't know if it was connected to a report. It was just a, just an article itself, but it was talking around how companies and these are more from like the buyer side, the companies that are looking to adopt IoT, how they're thinking about IoT connectivity, and it it sounded like they're thinking of it more as a feature mm. in 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 this context. Um, and I wanted to see if you could expand on kind of what that means and articulate it in a way that our audience could could really understand how that's changed from where it was before and why it's so important. Yeah, absolutely. A uh, little bit of context for, for this. So this is um, this is a, from a, a blog post that I wrote, which was based on a, a report uh, that we put together for Oracle. And that was based on a survey that we that we did, a survey of 800 enterprise IoT adopters, some some relatively mm -hmm. experienced IoT users. It was it was interesting to talk to these companies that have um, uh, have implemented IoT and and understand about how to integrate it with with um, back office systems. Okay. So we, we we spoke to these 
800, 800 companies to understand what their uh, approaches to IoT were, what their experiences of deploying uh, IoT were. And so we asked, uh, obviously, it was a survey. We asked a bunch of questions. That kind of go, goes without saying with um, with, with surveys. Uh, but a lot of it was around this this connectivity landscape. Um, okay. And one thing we we asked was around um, some of the, the costs associated with deploying uh, IoT. And connectivity came out as the lowest cost concern at least the lowest cost concern might not necessarily be the lowest cost but it's it's the thing it's the bit of the equation that's causing the the the, the least worry so you're almost getting to the point where that connectivity price isn't the the stumbling block isn't the isn't the challenge that was that was one interesting uh, point okay we then asked about okay how how do you prefer to buy your connectivity do you want sure. it bundled in with the solution that whoever your solution provider is is is, is giving to you and and that might be for or oh, any number of, of use that might be a smart metering use case or it might be a um, enterprise resource planning use case a whole whole bunch of, of different use cases across a, a um, six or eight verticals um, and they said uh, tw 24% said they wanted that connectivity would be completely bundled. They don't want to see the, 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 the connectivity. They don't want to have to even think about the connectivity. Um, they just expect it to be bundled as part of the, right, part of the right. solution. Uh, and then another 23% said, you know, I kind of want to see what it is, but I, I'm not really that bothered about um, uh, about having any control over it. So, so altogether, you've got almost 50% of companies that have said more or less the connectivity, I'll let somebody else can take care of of the right, connectivity right. piece of it. And, and historically, that would have been quite a significant uh, part of the equation. If you were putting together an IoT solution, you'd say, okay, well, I'm going to have to go to these guys and buy my connectivity, and I'm going to have to go to these other guys over here and buy my buy my hardware, and then I'm going to have to either develop some software or get a systems integrator in to do it or um, uh, use a, an existing uh, IoT platform of, of, of some sort. Uh, but the some of those component parts are kind of being subsumed into um, these more complete offerings from uh, other other players. Um, and the, uh, the the final uh, question that we asked about this this topic was about um, uh, we asked about a, a bunch of things to say, okay, well what do you want in an IOT solution? what's your what's your What's your preference? What kind of things should your solution provider be be um, be working on to make your IoT solution as, as as good as it possibly can be? And forty three percent picked as one of their top three that the connectivity should come come baked in. Mm -hmm. So it's just moving in that 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 quite firmly in that in that direction of the the connectivity not being a a, a separate component part that for about half of of, of solutions that. Um, uh, that the enterprises are, are buying. But I think this is also moving in the direction of an another interesting finding from the from the survey, which was that um, a lot of the um, or the the single most popular um, uh, vendor, so we asked the the uh, these enterprises, who would you go to? Who's your um, who, who's your vendor of choice, or what type of company is your is your vendor of choice? Who, who's your go to for um, right, for, right, for, right. for IoT? And um, we asked about their top three, and and um, the highest ranked in there was was IoT platform providers. So that might okay. be PTC or Microsoft or these various other other companies. Uh, and and the implication of it, of, of all of this is um, that more of the functionality, more of the capabilities kind of being baked in and readily accessible and, and, and um, easily deployed. You know, historically, we would have said, who's the first choice of, of um, enterprises for, for who to go to when they're deploying IoT? It's systems integrators. That's sure. going to be, that's number one choice. It's always, always number one choice. Historically, when we did surveys, it was always, always SI. Because you know, a lot of these projects are quite complicated. You've got, you know, a lot of things to plug into into a lot of a lot of other things, right? Um, and but but that came, I won't say a distant second, but certainly second. So that was forty two percent were, were of, of the respondents picked SIs in uh, as one of their top, one of their top three. So quite quite a way behind the the, the platform uh, players, and 
just anecdotally, this is something that um, the systems integrators have been have been struggling with a bit. This, this increasing productization, these product suites from the likes of say a Microsoft or an IBM or whatever that, that can be put in front of a of a client, and that client just take that product rather than needing serious heavy lifting uh, to to, um, to to build something uh, from scratch. So we've kind of seen a a tipping over into this more more productized space i mean it's continuation of a theme we've always seen this platformization this 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 idea of uh, you know simplifying the process by introducing these common uh, platforms but this it, this seems to be taking it just that that's that step even further where you're going more and more in the direction of uh, having a product rather than a, a, a service or a or a you know consulting based based approach right Right. And and I think that a large part of that, from what I've seen, is that platforms and by, you know, whatever we want to consider a platform company, they are evolving. So they're not just focused on providing you a tool for you to figure out how to use or a systems integrator comes in and figures out how to use and build on top of. These platforms are evolving to have to take out a lot of the heavy lifting, integrate with your whether it's your legacy systems, things through APIs through your own that you already have running in your business, whether it's how they integrate with new hardware, how it integrates with connectivity, all the different pieces more easily, it just mm -hmm. becomes kind of assumed this is that's how it's going to work. So these platforms, yeah. I think, are being more sophisticated, are are handling all those pieces that you needed somebody else like an SI or you know with a platform company to come in and help you put it all together. But this is all now becoming they're realizing that that complexity. And fragmentation in IoT is was hurting adoption. And mm -hmm. as the platform component, if we can build other pieces more easily into what we're doing to make those integrations more easy, then we are going to make adoption uh, easier for for our potential customers to then be able to provide them something that is more kind of productized. Which I think also brings us to a point of a conversation, which which is good to chat about is. Kind of the perception of what off the shelf means in iot as it relates to how the customization element because for as long as you can think about it, the iot solutions were, were customized right they're built for a specific use case specific end user etc how is how are you all seeing kind of that balance shift and i'd be interested to hear what off the shelf really means in in your or you're seeing mean in the industry as well as how that plays into the role customization is playing in um, application development and probably will play going forward? Uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, how, how do we see off the shelf? Well, let me let me preface that by saying um, about uh, for, based on the survey we did, we did ask about, OK, do you want an off the shelf solution or do you do you want somebody to come in and, and build this for you? And, and about two thirds of respondents said we, we want this off the shelf. Right. But then th there's an element of they would say that, wouldn't they? Because the implication of off the shelf is right. it's, it's 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 much easier. Yeah, and it's much it's cheaper. Right. right. I mean, right. It, it, right. It, it just it just is. Um, but I think that's following the market. Right. What, what you were saying uh, earlier was absolutely, absolutely right. We are seeing uh, the, the the platform companies kind of raising their raising their game or you know, m moving deeper into the into the value chain, if, if you like. But there's there is a limit to how far they can go, uh, to 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 my mind. So you look at somebody like Microsoft. Microsoft in, in introduced these industry focused um, uh, sets of of solutions. The idea being they're still going to uh, keep um, shy of um, actually doing consulting. Right? They'll do it a little bit just to prove the use case or to um, uh, to, to test the waters for a particular uh, solution, but ultimately what they want to do is is, is they want a, uh, a replicable uh, product offering, which is going to be fine for certain uh, certain clients, right? Somebody wants something that's just uh, that, that isn't that isn't bespoke by almost by by definition. Well, sure. absolutely by definition, which is fine if you're maybe if you're a challenger, if you're a smaller mm -hmm. player. You're someone who needs to keep your costs low uh, and, and you don't mind so much that you're putting all your eggs in one basket by by uh, committing to, to to somebody as a as a supplier and also happy that 
if the solution isn't going to be exactly what you need, but it's going to be 95% of the of the way there. Uh, and, and therefore, you can get maybe a, a leg up against the, 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 the competition um, who are probably bigger than you and probably develop this stuff customized and, and in-house. And they'll be slower moving. It'll cost them more money. But ultimately, they'll probably get something that's that 5% better. And the question right, right. is, in, in your market, is 5% better actually um, actually give you a, a, a significant leg up versus the, the, the competition? In some markets, I'm, I'm sure it does because it, it's, um, it, it, you know, if you're tight, tight margins, then, then it probably makes a, a whole lot of difference. So retail maybe or financial services, maybe it does make a, bit, a, a lot of difference. Um, so it, it's, it's going to be very specific to the, um, to, to, to the verticals, I think, the extent to which it, sure. it, it has an impact. Uh, and, but I think it's, it's not so much that it's a, a binary state either you're taking an off-the-shelf solution or you're taking a customized solution it's 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 a question of degree and what we're seeing is that is is the the degree of having something uh, off the shelf something that's it's an existing product um is is increasing i i completely agree i think the way i've kind of thought about it is as these platform companies and become more Kind of raising their game, like you were saying, um, they're ba they're able to build a lot of the necessary components for kind of that application layer for a particular use case to be, in a sense, off the shelf. Mm -hmm. But in order, but then there's that customization layer that goes kind of on top of it to make it exactly what a particular end user or company would need for their business. But by doing all of that stuff early on, building you know, libraries of tools, libraries of different components that you can easily kind of plug and play into building something that feels off the shelf before you get into the customization piece, which then brings down, I think, the cost of the customization so people aren't scared of when they hear customization, they think high cost anymore. Mm -hmm. I think all of that are things that are contributing to more likely adoption across different industries and use cases. I think you're going to start to see a lot of platform companies focus a bit more into a particular use case they have more domain expertise in and also have mm -hmm. maybe all the moving pieces already in place they just mm -hmm. need to put them together and and um and slap a little customization onto it to make it perfect i think if you can start to do that and make it feel the experience feel less complex than iot has felt over the years and with stuff we talked about before, having the connectivity baked in, having hardware already pre-integrated or the, a selection mm -hmm. of hardware pre-integrated into your system. Um, all those different pieces, you make it easier so the end user, when they buy it, the feel, even though it may not be this way, but the feel is that it's more turnkey, it's more off the shelf with a that little bit of you know uh, customization onto it. I think you're going to see people not only adopt, but understand iot a bit better mm -hmm. understand the value of iot a bit better as to how it applies to them as opposed to trying to push a platform and saying hey you can use this platform to build anything it's kind of like well I, I we don't even know how iot can benefit us yet can you tell us a little bit more specifically of what the use cases are in applications for my business specifically yeah. because i only care about that i don't care about all these different capabilities, all these technology things. I care about, does this do what I need for my individual business so I can go back to worrying about my business? Yeah, I, I think our expectation has been for the last few years that um, that these things verticalize a little bit, that the, sure. the market verticalizes a little bit. Yep. Because ultimately, yes, you, if you talk to pretty much any, any IoT vendor and say, can you do X? The answer will be, yes, we can. If right. you ask them, have you done X? Well, probably the, the responses in, in, in many cases will be slightly different. And, and we would tend to encourage adopters to look for companies who've got experience in the, in the vertical in which they operate. Right? You, don't, totally you don't want your, your supplier to be doing their, doing their learning on, on your time. You, wanna, you want somebody who's got, got yeah. expertise in this, in this area already, which naturally means that, OK, if I've built a lot of expertise in the industrial sector, well, people are going to keep coming back to me for 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 things relating to to the industrial right. sector. And you get this kind of virtuous circle within those those, those verticals that means that certain vendors would will, will tend to gravitate towards towards certain uh, certain vertical sectors, not net in part because they might have some specific capabilities that are particularly focused on those areas, but maybe a lot of the time just because they happen to have built up built up that 
that expertise in the, in those in those areas. I mean, I get, I'll give you a, a, a good example, not an IoT example, but robotic process automation. So automating some manual PC based tasks, it might be sure. sending invoices out or processing spreadsheets and you know, taking data out of one spreadsheet and putting it into another spreadsheet, right? 95% of it's probably common across all of the all of the RPA vendors, they do do pretty much the same sort of stuff. But um, there's also some specific stuff for understanding what what an invoice is and what the what the um, nuances are of of, uh, of invoicing companies and receiving and, and sending of invoices and if you can get to grips with those better than than, than others then you probably migrate in better in the direction of of uh, of addressing those kinds of kinds of verticals uh, rather than i don't know legal or some, some other some other sure, sure. So, and, and i think we see that in, in in iot to a to a certain certain extent we we certainly see it in what we um term data exchange so mm -hmm. this, this idea of having these multi-tenanted um uh, platforms which will um effectively ingest data from multiple sources and make it available to to third parties on a commercial basis there's a number of different ways in which it can can work but that's ostensibly it and the expectation is you know you get a critical mass you build a critical mass in one area you know you win a contract in healthcare well then the other people who are in the healthcare space are going to say oh well those guys have got you know hand, good at handling healthcare data we'll we'll um we'll we'll work with them and you naturally get this sort of snow snowball effect right, and, I think it, right, that, right. and that cuts across uh, across iot to a certain extent i mean i don't think it'll be completely cut and dried but i think we'll start seeing mm -hmm. some some, um, some emerging trends like that yeah, I think we'll start to also see some consolidation around the industry as we start to find or companies start to really focus their offerings around certain use cases or applications and really carve out that niche for themselves and, and kind of take a leadership stake there. I think it's going to be harder for other companies who are taking a more broader approach to say, hey, we have a platform that does everything to get into those when they're you're comparing them, like you're saying, to somebody who has domain expertise as well as... Um, um, experience building for this or something that's already more ready to go that helps bring down cost, time to market, all those kinds of benefits. I think all of that combined allows um, those companies to really have a leg up in these kinds of conversations. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's generally right. I, I think the one cloud on the on the horizon is maybe the fact that um, there's so much VCM private equity money sure. chasing so many so many companies. It, it kind of mitigates against roll-ups and and an m a that's based on the um a, you know a reasonable valuation of the company or the valuation of a company within another company but mm -hmm. rather it, it, it's predicated on uh, this is a potential unicorn it could be worth you know 20x what we're what we're sure. investing in it at the moment um and so we're seeing this across quite a few sectors you know there's 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 over overvaluation of companies in the in, in in the iot space not to say that companies in the iot space aren't valuable but we're seeing valuations are probably um double comparably mm -hmm. what we might have seen five years ago and and that and that's crazy if what you're looking at is the is the long-term uh, run rate and what you, what you might expect to, um, right. to to make off that organization if you if you brought it into a into a bigger organization so i i agree that that what you're talking about sh should be the trend but i think there's kind of that cloud on the horizon yeah i'm definitely interested to kind of see how that that um uh, injection of of fund funding kind of influences not just valuation of companies, but kind of the direction of the market in general. So, mm. so that'll be very interesting to see. Um, as we wrap up here, I have um, I have two kind of just final questions to quickly get through. One is from what everything that you've seen, what are some of the kind of high level best practices for IoT adoption um, from your perspective, which is definitely a different perspective than a lot of the companies I've spoken to mm. before. So I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on that. Um, and then I wanted to wrap up by just asking kind of what the what do you, what kind of projections you have for the future of, of the market kind of going forward, but let's start with that adoption best practices. Just a couple points that you think are important for people to be considering as they're, you know, looking into adopting IoT. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a whole whole bunch, but um, uh, in fact, we ran, ran a webinar back last year that was okay. looking at exactly these things. So re recommend taking a look at that. But it but it's things like um, um, the 
well, I talked about vendor selection. That's that's, that's a good one. Picking who your supplier is going to be. Look for companies that have have done the kind of thing that that um, that you want to do. Okay, okay. That, that that's one. Um, another is don't underestimate the internal changes that might might be necessary. We think about IoT in, in, in there's sort of two two elements of of, of IoT or two types of, of of IoT deployments. One is kind of not nice to have uh, cost cutting does some right. does, does some useful stuff on on, on the side. That's not going to be particularly transformational for the for the organization, but um, you, you know it, it, it's useful to do. But what we're seeing, and in fact this came out from the survey, was a, a bit more of a shift towards the rather more transformational uh, approach. Uh, right. So th things like okay. If you're tracking pallets, say, well, tracking pallets is useful just to make sure you're not spending too much on pallets and you can find your pallets when you need them, but it's not going to not going to change the business. But if you're a manufacturer of a, of a piece of heavy equipment and you decide, actually, I want to switch from from selling this to do to selling it as a service or providing it as a service using IoT, connecting the device and, and charging right, on right, a, right. You know, per, per whatever, per tons of potatoes sorted per uh, you know kilometer of whatever delivered you know that 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 kind of um, that kind of thing uh, and if you're if you're taking the ladder approach which which more and more companies are it's going to be transformational for everything that you do your finances are going to change your operations are going to change all of those those kinds of things um, and so b being aware of that and having a, uh, a change management plan um, is is absolutely critical. Uh, there's just a couple. I mean, they, I, could, I could rattle on. Sure, sure. That's, that's of, fantastic. A million and one things we'd, we'd advise. Yeah, we'll, we'll um, kind of, we can refer people to the webinar as well and just other content you all put out, which is always, always fantastic. Um, but the last thing I wanted to ask, just kind of what are your thoughts going forward into 2022? I know we kind of briefly touched on kind of where we are now, where we've come from over the last couple of years and slightly where we're going. But just to kind of sum it up in your minds, where do you see IoT going in 2022? It's going to be a bumpy year. Um, okay. I think we've got, well, okay. It's very difficult to uh, to, to predict what's going to happen with coronavirus and, and, and so on, but it does seem like things are um, taking a turn for the, for the better. And there's, there's quite a lot of pent up demand. We've seen... Mm -hmm. Uh, we saw demand depressed in 2020. It's rebounded somewhat in 2021, but I think there was still room for um, for, for for improvement. But I think as things open up even more in in 2022, I expect it to be a to be a strong year. Um, I, I mentioned about these thin IoT stack and getting all of those right. capabilities in place, and I, it feels like that's that that's in a, a strong position. You've got. Um, things like AWS and Microsoft taking this space much, much more seriously, really. Um, okay, regardless of what I think, the fact that those guys have now decided, okay, this is mature enough as a space. This isn't, you know, we, we, we're not at a bleeding edge anymore. This is a mature space, and this is worth our while getting into an, uh, an understanding. I think that's that's a pretty good indicator that that, mm -hmm. um, that 2022 is looking strong. N not without its challenges, though. I mean, things like um, uh, you've got a lot of, on, on the connectivity side of things, we talk about connectivity a lot, but um, on the connectivity side of things, you've got a lot of uh, price pressure. You know, we, we talk historically about um, a, you know, $1 per month for connecting a, a device to cellular, and that's heading in the direction of a dollar per year. So you've got those yeah. kinds of, of challenges associated with the with the market, but um, I, I think in terms of the, the in terms of, from the enterprise standpoint, from anybody who's adopting, well, the the array of tools that's available is is fantastic now and, mm -hmm. and, and really uh, does simplify the, the the process of getting this stuff deployed. That's fantastic, Matt. This has been been a great conversation. I really appreciate your time again. Um, Thank you, Matt. We'll have to make this more of a regular occurrence because the insights you all share are are, are great. The articles you have written are, are fantastic and the reports you guys put out are very valuable. So how can um, our audience learn more about Transform Insights, kind of read the content, follow along with kind of everything you're putting out? Because I, I, this is not, you know, a plug in any way outside of just the fact that I and many people I know find a lot of value in what you guys put out in the market. Uh, absolutely you can find us on uh, well our website transformer insights that's tra transformer with an a rather than er transformer insights.com okay. uh, or you can follow us on twitter uh, at transformer tweet okay. um, and you pretty much find whatever you need there um, i'd recommend taking a look at the blog 
Um, so a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about today, probably pretty much all of what we've been talking about today is available on the on the blog. Um, we've also got a free level of access to our, our, our site where you can get access to white papers and webinars and, and, and so on that's that's all on there. So um, so sign up there. Fantastic. Well, Matt, thanks again so much for your time. I appreciate it. It's been, been a great conversation. My pleasure. All right, everyone. Thanks again for watching that episode of the IoT for All podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, please click the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and be sure to hit the bell notification so you get the latest episodes as soon as they become available. Other than that, thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.